namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputassa uttam tammang sankar namasami With your permission, Lord Paul. <coughs> so congratulations to Lord Paul on his 70th birthday and also his elevation to a second level in the uh, Chao Kun ship. This is a, a great honor for Lumpa himself, but also for his community, our community, that, that the powers to be in Thailand recognize his work as being significant and continue to recognize that. And its significance is, of course, that the whole Sangha is thriving. This is wonderful to see, isn't it? You know, such a strong Sangha. Uh, living here and thriving, and all our all our monasteries are doing very very well, really. So it's it's very encouraging to see people interested to both go forth and and to practice as lay people. <clears throat> so what to say? <laughs> I was uh, observing this these offerings, and um, just how beautiful that was, wasn't it? one person after another person. After, and I could see their faces because I was seated here. One person, another person, and uh, just to be able to participate in something where I haven't really done anything, but I get all the joy out of it too. And that, that joy is the joy of, of beauty that we, how's that, does that sound better? No, no, it doesn't. Um, that we as human beings have the capacity to, to notice beauty, both architecturally, aesthetically, and but also emotionally and in our personal relationships. So um, I as a human being have the capacity to witness the joy of others. It's called medita. This is a beautiful, beautiful quality. I don't know if squirrels can do that. <laughs> The squirrels are my kuti. They're always fighting each other. They're not happy if the other one gets an acorn. These are different kind of beings. So we as human beings, we have animal instincts, but we also have very divine instincts. And these divine instincts or divine possibilities or divine emotions, the Brahma Viharas, are the encouragement that the Buddha gave us to cultivate that kind of beauty in our own lives. Not just aesthetic beauty, because aesthetic beauty is helpful. It's very helpful. But in itself, it can become an attachment and a conceit, actually. But the, the divine qualities of the heart are, are something that no one can really take away from us. So not only can I witness this beautiful ceremony and the the joy and, and um, just the way these the offerings were were wrapped. Wasn't that fantastic? They had these little stands and someone had sewn those little socks for them. You know, just coffee cans. <laughs> and someone had taken the time to sew the socks and those platters, where'd you get those? What was that about? <laughs> and then the I was watching the ladies wrap the cloth with uh, wrapping paper and then a little flower there. That's, that's such an act of the heart, isn't it? So rather than just giving, the, the, the act of the heart is something that is participated in in a long period of time. So the giving isn't just like this one act, it's the consideration, purchasing the material, uh, wrapping it, making the time to offer it, gracefully bowing. All this is a, a kind of accumulated divine quality, isn't it? Accumulated virtue. And the result is very, very good. So what I can do with this in the evening meditation tonight, I can remember that. I can, you know, I don't have to forget about it. I can take it to my meditation. I can begin the meditation with that. And I don't know everyone's name, but that's all right. I can get a feeling for that. And that can be the introduction to my, my meditation. And, and this is a capacity we have. We have a capacity both to, to do beautiful things and to remember beautiful things, to cultivate beautiful things in the heart. 
Unfortunately, we also have the other capacity. We have the capacity to do stupid things and unfortunate things and unpleasant things. And um, as human beings, we pay the price for that. So if I did something which was really uh, unskillful or cruel, then my evening meditation would be plagued by that. It would be hard for me to forget it, actually. So we have, a, we have a possibility, we have a responsibility. When we, when we be, begin these ceremonies, we always begin with the, the five precepts. And the way we, we think about well-being and beauty and happiness in a Buddhist context is that there are ways of happiness which, are, which come about through not doing something. They come about through restraint. So not killing, and not stealing, and not lying, and not being promiscuous, and not being inebriated and intoxicated. These, the results are a certain kind of happiness because the mind's not plagued by remorse, regret, self-doubt, self-disparagement, self-hatred, all those kind of poisonous qualities that the human mind can experience. So there's a happiness from not doing, and there's a happiness from doing. So we have the happiness of doing here. Dana, metta bhavana, karuna, uddita, these, these expressions. So there's a part of us which is expressive, and there's a part of us which is wise and doesn't express. We all, we all know, say, that there are certain levels of happiness which are very immediate. You eat something you like, but there are levels of fulfillment which require a delay in gratification. If I want to meditate, say, if I want to meditate, and I've never meditated before, I could sit down and after five minutes think, that was a bad idea. Let's watch Netflix. Much nicer. <laughs> so I get a certain happiness or gratification from the Netflix. But then I realize that's not really making me peaceful, and it's costing me a lot of money, and the movies aren't that good anyway. <laughs> so then I decide, well, maybe, maybe I'll forego the short-term pleasure of the Netflix for the long-term benefit of peace. Uh, and this is education or training, as Long Paul's saying. So I sit down, I start to meditate, and then after five minutes, the same idea comes up. This is a stupid idea. I, should, I think I'll watch a movie. But I say, no, I'll forego the pleasure of the Netflix for a long-term result, for a long-term result, which is more beneficial. And so I sit there, and I feel restless, and I look at the clock, five and a half minutes, five and three quarters minutes, and I feel restless. And now it's not pleasant. It's not a pleasant experience. But there's something in me which realizes just following my impulses hasn't been really giving me very good results. And so I begin to witness restlessness. I begin to notice restlessness as an object. And as I notice restlessness as an object, and I'm patient with it, I begin to touch the peace of the heart, which is more profound than a Netflix movie. So I can still watch the Netflix, but now I have another possibility. I have a deeper possibility which comes about through training, through education, through understanding, through developing virtuous qualities. When we, one of the things we do a lot as human beings is we, we think, we've noticed that I hope, <clears throat> we think a lot, don't we? Uh, so part of the understanding of the human consciousness, of human experience, is to understand thinking. When I, when I went back to Canada, I had been a monk for five years. I, my dad had sort of finally come around that I wasn't going to leave as a monk. So when I first became a monk, he was more than disappointed. He was shocked. <laughs> Poor man. But he came around, he said, okay, he wants to do this. He said, yeah, it sounds all right. And then I told him one of the things we try to do as monks, that we try to train in quieting the mind to no thought. 
And he said, that's impossible. He was an intellectual. Thought was very, very important for him. And to go to the space of no thought, you can't do that. That's not possible. I said, well, I'm trying. <laughs> I'll give it a go. Now, the space of no thought is something we don't notice because we are so caught up with thinking. And so to train the mind, what we need to do is become much more aware of our thinking processes, to become conscious of the very nature of thought rather than to be thinking all the time. It's quite hard. It's quite a difficult thing to do because so much of thought, uh, of thought is habitual. We just think, 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 think. So what we try to do in Buddhism is begin to develop right thinking, yeah? a way of thinking which gives a perspective on the habits of thought. And the way, the way we do that is we make an intention in our daily life, in our daily life practice, is to notice the mood of the mind when we're thinking. So when, let's say, if I'm, if I'm worried about something in the monastery, there'll be a narrative, won't there? There'll be a story. Uh, I'll be thinking about this, what's going to happen there? So not only will there be the narrative or the story, there'll also be a mood. There'll be an underlying tone to the mind. If I'm irritated or I'm angry, then the tone of the mind will be irritation or angry. There'll be a story, there'll be a narrative, I'm angry at A, B, or C. If I'm fantasizing about something, uh, if I'm anxious about something. So what we're trying to do is, as we develop self-awareness, we're trying to get behind the thinking processes, see, see more deeply into the thinking processes, rather than be caught up into the narratives all the time. And when we do that, you'll notice that you actually... The types of thoughts we have aren't that many. The stories are infinite. But actually, the, the, the moods of the mind that we have, you know, there's maybe five or six. You know, you're anxious maybe 20% of the time. Irritated maybe 20% of the time. That's, a, that's already 40%. <laughs> right? So, I won't cover the rest of your 60%. I'll leave that to you. But... You can see that if I have enough awareness to begin to inquire into the nature of worry, rather than just worrying all the time, I begin to have a perspective which is, which is a kind of intelligence. If I'm just caught in worrying all the time, and I try to get rid of the worry, that's not very intelligent, it's just a verse. But if I want to understand my own mind, I need to understand worry. If, if I worry 20% of the time or I'm irritated 20% of the time or whatever, if I don't understand those fundamental moods of mind, then I'll never be free because something will always trigger worry, fear, uh, anger, fantasy, whatever. So I begin to make the intention to awaken to the mood of the mind. Now, Lopat Chai used to... Hi, John, how did Lopat... He said, so arom? Is that how you... So... So arom. My tie is pathetic. Um, Lobachar taught that a lot. And I find that really helpful because I was just trying to sort out the storyline. But he said, no, check out the mood of the mind. What's the underlying tone of the mind? Huh? Now, this isn't a judgment that you should not feel anxious or that you should have metta for everyone all the time because that's impossible. But rather, what is it like to feel anxious? What's it really like to be anxious? What's it feel like? And that's the awakening of Bhutanasati. That's the awakening of Puru, or that's the awakening of the refuge in Buddha. So the way I've been taught, and I think all of us have been taught, the refuge in Buddha is this mind which, which is awake to the way things are, which knows the way things are. Now, when I'm caught in a narrative of, of fear or anger or anxiety, I don't know the way things are. I'm just a prisoner to the habits of anxiety or to the hab habits of, of anger. But when I awaken and I, and I notice, so anxiety feels this way, I'm beginning to practice the path to the end of anxiety because I'm no longer the anxious person. I know anxiety as an object. Can you see that? Can you see the difference? That there's a difference between me thinking anxious thoughts, what's going to happen, I don't know what I'm going to do, and awakening think, oh, this is anxiety. There's a huge difference, isn't there? And that's the difference of freedom. 
It's not that you can suddenly get rid of anxiety because it's a habit and, and it has its place you know, in, in, in human consciousness. But once I begin to do that and I make an intention, then I can introduce right thought. Because now I know anxiety feels this way. Oh, this is anxious. And then I can introduce right thinking rather than narrative thinking or storyline thinking or attached thinking or papancha or prungdang or whatever you want. Prungdang is the best word in the world. You know, I don't know if we're a user or not, Thai. Prung means to season, right? Restaurant. Uh, yeah, I can never get the tone right. <laughs> Prung dang. So anyway, however you say it. <laughs> One means to season, and dang means to dress up. Dang, dang tua. And it's, it's, a, it's a really lovely combination that they used a lot, and they usually use a lot in Thailand. When you're caught in mental proliferation, mental proliferation that's not as uh, graphic. Huh? But when, when there is anxiety, huh? And then the and thinking grabs it, and you season it up and dress it up. It just gets worse and worse and worse, and it, make, it seems more and more unreal. If you then say to yourself, "I shouldn't be anxious," that's a horrible thing. Yeah, every, every, has everyone ever done that to you? You're anxious, and they say, "Don't be anxious." <laughs> you want to kill them. <laughs> that doesn't help at all. But rather, what we say, we say, "How does anxiety feel?" That's different. And, so, and that's what we say to ourselves. We say, what does it feel like to be anxious? Well, it feels terrible. No, no, no. What does it really feel like? Not, not a judgment of it, but what does it really feel like to feel anxious? Then we're awake. We're awake to the feeling or the nature or the dhamma of anxiety. And from there, we can cultivate right thought. So what kind of thoughts we can put in? We can put in a thought of, I hate this, <laughs> or I don't want this to be there. That's not right thought. Or we can put in the thought, may I be free from anxiety. May I be free from anxiety. May all beings be free from anxiety. And that's a whole different mindset, isn't it? Because it's not anxious, it's compassionate. And it's not denying anxiety, it's not saying you shouldn't have it. But it's putting in another, whole, a different mind direction, say, because the nature of anxiety, it's a direction. The mind is in, inclining towards this particular mood. It might be anxiety, anger, whatever it is. It's moving in this direction. You awaken to it, and when you awaken to it, you can start to incline it to another direction. Now, that takes a lot of work if the habit is 30 years in the making, or 30 lifetimes in the making, who knows? If it's 30 years in the making, then to start to shift it, it's like shifting the type, like a, like a big ship. But what else is there to do? And if you have faith, and if you trust in this process, each time you awaken, anxiety feels this way, may I be free from anxiety, may I be free from anxiety, may I be free from anxiety. The mind begins to move towards the Brahma Viharas, towards compassion and kindness. You still have to think. You still have to solve your problems, but functional thinking is different than anxious thinking. It's completely different. And so right thought and wrong thought are terribly important, obviously. Wrong thinking just takes us down a rabbit hole of suffering. Whereas right thought is, is, a, it, it is a way of giving... Again, like I was saying last night, it gives meaning to the very things that we get caught up to. Because... Quite often, when we're training the mind, we think, oh, this is hopeless. This is never going to end. But when we understand, no, we can make the causes now for non-anxiety in the future. We can do that. We have that power. But you have to have faith in that. You have to have trust in that. And if, you, and if you have faith and trust in that, then you just know, okay, anxiety is this way. Or anger is this way. Or fear is this way. And may I be free from anger. May I be free from fear. May all beings be free from anger. Now when you expand it like that, not just my anxiety, but everyone, and the, the anxiety I'm feeling right now, or the fear, or the anger, is just the same as everyone who's feeling the same thing. Right? And you start to universalize this feeling of anxiety, say, as, a, as an example, or anger. You say, just as I want to be free from anxiety, may all beings be free from anxiety. May all beings be free from 
anger. And your heart starts to really open. Because what is anxiety or anger or any, any mode of self, self-suffering, what is it? It's a closing down of the heart, isn't it? It's a kind of locking into your own, your own drama and your, and your own sad narrative. And then what do we need to do? We don't need to just kind of get rid of things. We need to somehow expand things, don't we? And this is what the ideas of metta bhavana are about. Uh, of karuna metta and you can do that through right thought now sometimes people think that metta bhavana the, the practice of the heart means that you have some kind of gushing feeling right you just love everyone all the time that's sentimentality you know sentimentality is what you feel when you look at Lion King <laughs> oh. you know oh, is, aren't the lions sweet <laughs> No, they'll eat you. <laughs> They're not all that sweet. So that's sentimental. And sentimental's okay, right? And that's why sometimes people get turned off by the practices of metta men, maybe more than, I don't know, but cynics especially. But this, this sense of, may I be free from suffering, may you be free from suffering, can begin just with just a few words. Right thinking. And that right thinking takes you in a direction which begins to open the heart. And if you, if you do that, if you use both language, but also you use your heart chakra, the heart chakra is very sensitive, isn't it? When, when you, when, when um, let's say that the, the, the birthday girl gave us two jackets here, right? And, and sweetest thing, right? And, and that sweetness you feel here, don't you, in the heart? Or, when people are kind to you, you feel it here in the heart. But also, when you're anxious, you feel it here. When you're angry, you feel it here and in your guts, right? You feel it there. So it's, I, I think it's very, very important to, to cultivate not just thought, but also to cultivate this area of our being. And you can do that, can't you? You can actually cultivate your heart. You can, when you, may I suggest, when you wake up in the morning, uh, let's say, let's say you, you suffer from insomnia and you wake up at 2 in the morning. Huh? And what do you do? Well, usually, you hate the morning. And you, you know, you think, oh God, I have to go to work, it's 2 a.m. <laughs> and your mind goes off into negativity. And then you bump around, you know, until like 5, and then you give up, and you get up, and you think, you're in a terrible mood. <laughs> so you've created that mood from inadvertence. But, you can, you can also do something different, you can, and it works quite well. It's when you come out of deep sleep, when you come out of deep sleep, your, your mind is very, very silent and, very, and the heart's very, very open. And when you're coming out of that deep sleep, the ego starts to emerge. The world gets born, me and my problems and, and the world around me. Well, and so you kind of go forward into the world of becoming. My suggestion is if you go to the heart and you just lay there in, in sarvasana, in the corpse posture, you can kind of go back to the depth of peace and deep sleep, but be aware. We don't usually do that because we're trying to get to sleep, right? Which is, which is a kind of restlessness. Well, so rather than trying to get to sleep, why not just lay there, make your body very, very still, and go to the heart chakra. Try it. Uh, and if it doesn't work, don't write to me. <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> now, the, the, one, of the, one of the meditations I suggest a lot for people is the lying meditation. I'm 72 years old now, so it's allowed. Um, my knees are, you know, they're not the greatest. They're kind of old, <laughs> like my voice. Um, so what I've learned to do is to do lying meditation. And a lying meditation, first of all, feels like cheating. Because you know, meditation is supposed to hurt. <laughs> you know, your back has to be at least dislocated after a half hour. And then you feel, oh, I really did some meditation. <laughs> but actually, when you read about meditation, the, 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 the factors of good meditation are happiness, not torture. And if you're having to hold your body up, in pain all the time, you know, you, you might develop some endurance, or you might have enough 
concentration to blot out your body, but you're still going to have to limp away afterwards. Well, with lying meditation and yoga, they call it yoga nidra, you, you lay down uh, in sarvasana, and those are in, in the, what they call the corpse posture. You make yourself comfortable. You, you put maybe a, a pillow under your knees so your knees aren't uh, too stretched. And the main, and you're going to sweep through your body. And the main factor in lying meditation is to not move. That's the main, main, main thing. Okay? So you make an aditana to not move. And what you'll find is that within five minutes you want to move, even though you're comfortable. Right? And what you'll want to do is you want to do like, like scratch your ear, right? Or, or move. Basically, you'll probably want to go over on your side and annihilate the mind and fall asleep. That's the basic movement towards annihilation. Roll over on your side. So what you're doing in lying meditation is you're noticing that. You're noticing the, the pain or the itch or the desire to move, and you don't move. You just don't move. That's all you have to do. And it's not like, I'm not going to move. <laughs> it's not, it's just, it's mental. <laughs> it's not rigid. It's oh. And what you'll find is, you'll, you'll find that the body will bring up uh, like, like an itch. And the itch will come up like electricity, and then you have a spasm. You'll do that a lot. Uh, or or you'll, you'll, you, you'll get really restless, and you just want to roll over. Don't move. And then don't move again. <laughs> and then if you're wondering what you should do, don't move. That's you know, just one instruction, very easy. So, so then people say, well, my, my mind wanders off. Well, I suggest, okay, let it wander. You fall asleep, great. That's what you want anyway. <laughs> so not a problem. But, but, if... You can't fall asleep, and now you use it as a meditation, then you're not creating a lot of negativity, like worry. How am I going to work tomorrow? I have to work. And actually, in that posture, you get a lot of rest, because the body is very, very rested, and your mind's very, very rested. So you have to kind of give up this idea of however hours of sleep you need, because you're not falling asleep, right? It's not like I'm saying you shouldn't sleep. If you fall asleep, great. But actually, you're using that, and a lot of us have that. A lot of us have kind of um, broken sleep patterns or whatever. <clears throat> you actually use that uh, to actually calm the mind. And, and then I would suggest that the heart chakra, there's something, I don't, I don't know what it is, but there's something about deep sleep, silence, and the heart chakra, which to me is very connected. I haven't figured it out. I haven't seen it in the text. But anyway, I can suggest it. That's all I can say, is that... The, the, the heart chakra seems to be very resonant there for me. So when I, when I come out of deep sleep, the heart chakra seems to be very active in a, in a very loving way, in a very kind way. And so what I try to do, as soon as, as, soon as consciousness, uh, kind of emer or awareness, since whatever emerges, I don't know what emerges, as, as that becomes conscious, then rather than la allow the mind to go and be restless, I go to the stillness. Go to the stillness of the body and go to the heart chakra. Now, it's a kind of experiment. And for those of you who have, say, arthritis or, you know, have you have a lot of bodily pain, don't give up on meditation. <clears throat> there was a chap last year, you know, I gave a retreat in Pak Chong in Thailand. And he was an older gentleman and he had cancer and a limited amount of time and uh, quite a lot of bodily pain. And I asked him, just try that. He had kind of given up on meditation. Just, just try laying there and being very, very still. And he said, it worked. It wonderful, wonderful how it worked. Okay. So, so um, it's, you know, we, t we have four postures in Buddhism. Uh, sitting, standing, lying, and walking. And usually the lying posture, it's, it, you see it like that. To me, that didn't work. My, my arm fell asleep. <laughs> so that's iconic. But... As you get older, you'll probably notice that sitting becomes more difficult. And, and so sometimes it's good, if you want to experiment, to actually do it when you're not sleepy. Like, I'll have a cup of coffee and lay down. So I won't associate it with sleep. It's just a formal posture. 
And because my, my, my knees are wonky and my, my back is not the best, uh, I found a very, very uh, profitable posture. And what's very interesting is how, how just the stillness, the determination of stillness takes you to stillness. Because right? now you're not reacting to the uh, itching or whatever in the body. Um, so why did I go there? I'm not sure. <laughs> Anyway, it's, it's, oh, I was talking about the heart chakra, wasn't that, right? So I think for me, um, the, the, the Brahma Viharas are very important. Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka. Now Upeka, Upeka is the peaceful coexistence with the way things are. And it's the most difficult, I would say, for me. And where I had, I, and I was talking to the monks about this the other night, um, when I was caring for my mom, I, I was with my mom for nine years, and her last nine years, she lived to be uh, 96, and it was a really very beautiful time. She, she was compass mentis right through, she didn't have any um, dementia, she was legally blind and had bad osteoporosis and so on, but, but she was, her mind was very, very clear. And, and uh, the, the, the metta, the metta bhavana, the goodwill, was very easy, obviously. Mom, may you be well. No problem. Karuna was very easy. Compassion. What can I do for you? How can I help you? How can I help you with the pain? Mudita was also easy. So I, I um, in the nine years I was with her, in the, um, in the end of the fourth year, we started the monastery near Ottawa. And so for the next five years, I would go every weekend, like every Saturday morning I'd go to the monastery, and then every Sunday afternoon I would return. And I did that for five years. And it's about an hour and a half drive from the monastery to Ottawa. My mom, my mom loves flowers, so every Sunday we would go to the same uh, grocery store and I'd get flowers for her. And then I'd take the flowers, and then I'd arrive home, and she'd be all happy to see me again. There was someone there with her, but and then I'd have I'd real corny. I'd have the flowers behind my back, you know, and ta da! <laughs> and I would look at her fl- face, and I would just feel this joy, because she was so joyous. Right? And then I would take that for my evening meditation. I did that for five years. Now, you know, you do that for five years. It's great. It's great on the heart. And that reverberated till now, to now, right? So we can, we can do that physically, yes, by doing things, but then that is felt here, isn't it? It's felt in the heart. And if we, if we learn to go there, not just when, when we do that, if we just learn to abide there, we'll also see when it closes. You know, when there's anger or anxiety or, or those kinds of emotions, we'll see. And we'll begin to monitor the moods of our life through the body rather than just through thought. Because yeah. thought is very, very secondary. If I, if, I, if I say to you, like, what's the color of that flower? You'll say it's yellow. Yeah, but yellow is not the color. The color is such. Right? It's like that. And then we put a name on top of it. And thought does that. Like when you feel angry or anxious or whatever it is, thought is removed from the anxiety. Thought is one step. But to actually feel anxious, to know anxiety, you have to let go of thought and come into the feeling. And the way to do that, and we have a lot of that recommendation in Buddhism, is to feel the heart, to feel the body, to know the body. And then you are educated, not just through thought, but educated through the body. You have a kind of... Uh, a, body, a body understanding, don't you? And we all do this naturally. I'm just kind of encouraging you to actually make it more deliberate because and, 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 it's very, very useful. So then if you have an anxious situation, um, like I found that giving talks at funerals always made me very anxious because everyone was always crying. <laughs> so I have to stop their crying or whatever. Uh, and then I would just go here. So back to my mother and Upeka, like with my mother, so the metta was, was easy. The karuna, the mudita were easy, but the upeka was really hard. And why? Because I didn't want her to suffer. 
But not wanting, to, not wanting her to suffer was my attachment. And it wasn't karuna, it was worry and anxiety. And I could see that when, with my mom, when I, when I functioned from worry, she would worry. And she'd not tell me that she's in deep pain. You know, we'd all we'd be, be kind of, she'd try to keep it a secret and I'd try to keep it a secret. But when I didn't worry and I say, how does it feel? She oh, it's very painful this morning. Oh, yeah. I say, yeah. I'd have compassion, but I wouldn't go to worry. And that's upeka. Upeka is the capacity to be at peace with the suffering of your loved ones. And how hard is that? And how hard is that? It's very hard. Very hard. But the other actually doesn't help. It doesn't really help. So the sense of acceptance and say, oh, at 96 years old or 95 or 90, what did you want? <laughs> what do you expect, right? So it's this way. 90-year-old 90 90 mother feels this way. And, we're, and this is what we're doing with ourselves and others. We're trying to practice this this kind of sense of peace with the way things are, and then offer our help, offer our metta karuna in these different ways. So as, as human beings, we think, we have emotions, we act in the world, we have all these possibilities. And the Buddha's offering was in all those realms, all those realms, to try to develop that capacity for human beings to, 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 be, to be fully but be fully conscious and, and, and emotionally fully developed through, through these Brahma Viharas. All right, I'll leave that for your reflection then. Pandamayam Damakataya Sadhu Karangadamase Sadhu